Welcome to the Word Exchange Podcast. Uh, we have we have Stuart Williams again with us. What's up? He was <laughs> mid drink. I waited till he <laughs> took that drink. Half gulp. Yeah. Uh, welcome back. Thanks, uh, man. We had a good episode on PTSD and mental illness with him and uh, David and Sergio. Was it Sergio? Yep. Yeah, yeah. It was a good episode. Um, so I'm glad I have him back on again. Maybe talking about other things. Uh, what he's into, um, what he's got going on. And then we have Michael Hari. So this guy right here, I've actually spent a lot of time with. Like a <laughs> lot, an, a a lot of time. That's, a, that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we, we worked on the 2019 conference film together. Yep. Mm-hmm. We went to Canada. Uh, we, were at, we were gone for um, like 15 days. Yeah, like, a long time. We have him as a guest. Um, pretty much everyone on here besides me is a guest tonight, which is awesome. And then we also have Pete. How are you? Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, I want to open this up. <laughs> so Stuart brought me this uh, ginger beer. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, no Thank problem, you. man. Michael's not going to drink his because he, he's, he's real selective Ooh. with his ginger brews. <laughs> Super gingery. Oh, wow. That is strong, bro better than last but time. it's good yeah. isn't it it burns your throat huh <laughs> just a little a little bit <laughs> i haven't had this I, I, i've had one from pastor garrett no I, yeah i really enjoy different kinds i the the reeds like what you were mentioning earlier uh they're good but uh, like it's got too many chunks of ginger in it for me and it just gets weird with the texture of it but this one's good because it's got the spice and the kick you know all the fun none of the None of the chunks. Nice. So they actually put chunks chunks of ginger in some of them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Some of them are a little less processed. It's like pulpy yeah. orange juice. I'm glad you got this one because I can't even do, like, pulpy orange juice. Yeah, it's yeah. Got You got to go pulp-free? Yeah. It's got a good shame. balance to it, like you yeah, were saying. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's Thank you. delicious. Yeah, I like man. it. Pete, where are you from, man? So I was born in Northern California, and uh, so I was born in Santa Rosa. Okay. And at the time, uh, my mom was living in Petaluma, California. And that's her. My dad ended up meeting. My mom was a cocktail waitress. My dad was a musician in a band. And so that's how they met. And I was born in the same uh, hospital that my dad was born in, in Santa Rosa. They uh, had a very tumultuous childhood. So hmm. they, uh, they separated when I was two years old. And my mom ended up moving here to Tucson. And my, uh, my dad ended up moving to Prescott. Oh, wow. Because we were talking about, we went full circle on that. Oh, one. so yeah. you, you know how to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> that's local. Prescott. <laughs> Prescott. <laughs> I'll, change, I'll change the way I say it just because that's the official way. Yeah. So, Rachel, so the locals me. say Prescott. Yes. Everybody else says Prescott. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I, I hate to coin like that I was a local, but I mean, I did travel there a lot because yeah. um, my parents were divorced. So I'd you know, go see my dad for the summer. So mm-hmm. he, at the time, he worked in the only music store in all of Prescott, which was Prescott Music Center. Mm. So, uh, and I did, uh, I ended up moving there for one year. I got in a lot of trouble my freshman year in high school here. So I had to go stay with my dad for a year. So I went to, I went to Prescott High School for my sophomore year. You, you kind of made your way from, because I, I lived in California for two years. Okay. I went to, I was, I was like 12, maybe 11. Uh, it's a crazy story, actually. My, they're trying to murder my family. Whoa. Um, I was, I was a kid. Uh, I know it's, I shouldn't have drank that. (laughs) I waited till you were, you had your mouth full of, uh, liquid. Uh, but, um, my mom, she recently told me the full story. Um, but she, she, she didn't know who they were, but, um, she was with some shady guys, you know, at the time, Mm -hmm. shady guy, I should say they, they had broken up and then I don't know what he was into, but they were trying to, cause he, he, she has, um, one kid from him. And they were trying to like get back at him or somehow, and so I remember one night, and and, and it all makes sense once she told me the story. But we were we were sleeping under the beds, yeah, <laughs> wow. yeah. Wow, and um, she, I guess they had like three or four guys with like uh, assault rifles in our yard waiting for oh whoever God. was going to show up. And <laughs> so I remember um, after a while that night, we all um, packed up and we took a greyhound. Mm. They, but we were like. I mean, again, I was a kid. I don't know all the details, but from what she told me, like we were undercover, man, just like yeah. getting out of there. And we went to, went to California, um, lived there for two years. I was like in third grade at the time. And um, Lancaster and Palmdale was the areas that we were in. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty interesting, man, um, that you made it your way to Tucson. 
I know yeah. that's a crazy story to tie it in, but well, actually, so <laughs> this is even crazier. And the funny thing is, you and I didn't even talk before this. I no. had something very similar happen when I was younger. What? So I didn't know how much I was going to get into the story, but I'm just going to go full disclosure. <laughs> oh, Let's go go for it, man. We love it. So what happened was, you know, uh, my dad was dealing dope up there, and he wasn't like a big time dope mm-hmm. dealer. You know, he was more of a user, but we just key. yeah deal on the <laughs> side, right? So he uh, had a connection there that. Um, he was dealing for and him and my mom were having a real brutal divorce and custody battle with me. Mm. And so uh, when this was happening, my mom was coping with it by drinking a lot. Mm. And she ended up uh, not frequenting the bars that my dad frequented because he was a musician and knew a lot of people. She was running kind of with a different crowd. And one of the bars that she would frequent was a bunch of off-duty cops would go there. Mm. And she would get drunk and intoxicated and she would mention about, yeah, well, you know, my ex-husband's dealing dope for her. And she would say the guy's name, Ooh. right? And it, and it started getting from bad to worse. And so uh, my mom would get these phone calls and, hey, look, I know you and my dad's name is Pete. You know, you and Pete are going through this uh, real, you know, hard time. We feel for you. Mm-hmm. But you, I don't want to say the guy's name, but you need oh, to yeah. stop mentioning uh, X. So-and-so. Yeah. So-and-so when, right. when you're, you know, uh, you can't bring that up. You can't bring the drugs up. You've got to stop. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then, she, you know, she'd go get inebriated and, you right. know, just start talking again. And the phone call conversations would escalate to where uh, someone else called, hey, and there was even, I think, a person came to visit her one time. Hey, you've got to stop mentioning so-and-so's name and mentioning drugs and your husband. You, you guys, I feel bad for you. You're going through a hard time, but you need to but, stop. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think this was like, came to her work and mentioned it. And again, it happened again. And she remembered the thing that really struck her was she got this phone call in the middle of the night that if you mention so-and-so's name or drugs one more time, you will never see your son again. Click. Mm. And wow. so, yeah, it got real, real mm-hmm. for her. And she had been, uh, I think, dating another guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, things weren't going well for them. him. He had just gotten out of a divorce. So uh, him and my mom and myself, we ended up moving to Tucson. So mm-hmm. that's what precipitated the whole Isn't thing. Isn't that crazy? It is. And then my dad, too, wanting to... I think get a, a fresh start and yeah. get, get out of dealing drugs it seems, and stuff. It seems like a lot of people come to Arizona for a fresh start. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> it's true. It's Especially true. from Many California. People. Yes. Yeah. It's like, it's like a mass exodus from California right now. It is. And I think yeah. it's just even grown in recent years. Uh, but so, yeah. So, I mean, that, that was like the, the early beginnings, you know, of my childhood. And then, but through, in wow. Tucson, it was, uh, you know, kindergarten through high school. And then I joined the Navy and that's how I left. Oh, you joined the military? I did, yeah. So I was in the Navy for five years. Wow. And I was on the East Coast. And so, but then coming back all these years later, as you were saying, like, the mass exodus of Californians to here, it's like, <laughs> we've become a suburb of California almost. So you see the price of housing going up and yeah. everything, and it's like, it's no, no seem, like, no sign of it stopping at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's I'm, crazy. I know, Michael, you, you grew up in, you were born and raised here, right? Yeah, born and raised. It's crazy. My mom, whole life. my mom knows his family. Because my mom's not really, like, too much, like, she left the church when she was, um, for a few years. And so she's back now. Um, not as much, but she still comes because of COVID and everything. She watches from home. Right. Which is smart. A lot of people do that. But um, my mom was telling, I had Michael over for uh, lunch the other day. And yeah. she was like, yeah, I remember uh, your parents. And they remember me when I was pregnant. And. I had no clue. And then your mom on confirmed Sunday. on Sunday. <laughs> She's like, ah, I remember Miguel when he looked like the baby. And yeah. so I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> so that's crazy, man. Yeah. yeah. And me and Michael have been buds since birth, too. My, Long my parents and his parents have been family since I can remember. He's basically my brother from another mother. <laughs> nice. We were saying the other day, I remember, like, his dad was, he used to be the door director. And, like, let me just make sure all the doors are locked. Everything's good at the church. And I remember, like, me and Stuart playing a game or something while we walked to every single door in the church to check the doors, <laughs> like, late at night after a concert or something like that. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what's crazy about, like, the fellowship, you know, there's, people grow up together, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I, I like this, this format because you're not at all from our fellowship. Right. But... We're, we're, we get, we can have that chance to get to know you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's awesome. I mean, I started, I got saved. I, I became a Christian when I was like 13, 12, um, when we came back, actually. And then I came to church, got saved that day, and just Whoa. never left. Wow. 
and I don't I don't really remember it. You know what I mean? Um, I don't I don't remember any of my childhood stories really. Only the the crazy ones. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's one time I I found a gun and shot it and got scared and mm-hmm. told my mom it was a it was a firecracker. You know, <laughs> those kind of stories are the ones that I remember. But I don't remember like growing up. Mm-hmm. You know, I just. Well, I think it's like blocked out of your mind yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah, it's it's very common. Is it's, it? It's yeah, and one of the one of those things you know you work through whenever you're dealing with. Uh, I'm a nurse, and I you know okay. work with psych patients a lot. That's my my job, and it's super common for people to uh, to either their brain edits what happened mm-hmm. to to alter it in a way that either makes them feel okay with it, or their brain completely tries to forget it no matter what it is there's some kind of alteration a lot of times um, and it usually just comes from we have an amazing ability to be resilient and our minds are designed kind of that Mm -hmm. way to be able to put the past in the past and let it fade away and that's what's that's whenever we talked about uh, about PTSD on the last one is what's happening in that situation is is the short-term memory is not converting to long-term memory. Mm. So, you know, short-term memory is, you know, something happening right here, right now. Like we'll go home, we'll think about what happened tonight. Right. And then it'll start to convert to long-term memory while we sleep. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow morning, it won't be as vivid as it was today. And that's the way memory is supposed to work. right? Right. But unfortunately, whenever you have those kinds of things, it can either become one of two things. It's either stays at the forefront of your brain and becomes PTSD type issues Mm. And then, or it can get completely edited out and you still end up with behavioral and other health issues because of the trauma that happened to you, but you just don't, you don't, you don't ever process it. You'd rather just forget it, you know? So it can go one of two extremes, you know? So do you like ever think about like those moments? Like obviously you didn't know God at that time, but you ever be like, whoa, like God kept me at that time. Like all this stuff was going on around you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it even gets, it's crazier. I mean, I, and I don't want to. Tell us your story, man. I don't yeah, want to tell the whole thing. No, 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 no. Like, no yeah. We're here. There's tell another us. time you talked about trauma. So I was thinking about, I was, uh, <clears throat> my friends and I were uh, heading to a video store to rent some, I like, think, DVDs to have a sleepover at someone's house. And I was on this, I was riding this bike. So I had a 20 second in Sarnoff. Best bike. <laughs> so I, I, I pedaled down and the chain fell off the bike and the handlebars flipped like this. And I flew into the handlebars and I ruptured my spleen. Whoa. And I was in the seventh grade. So um, I, I didn't realize it, but I was internally bleeding. And I, I just felt like I'd never broken a rib, but it felt uh-huh. like I broke my rib. And I said, man, I, I don't think I could go walk any further. <clears throat> and it just so happened that a, uh, a family friend, there was a, there was a bar there at the time, had come walking out of the bar and saw me on the ground. And he's like, oh, you don't look good. And so he threw the bike in the back of the car and took me. He's like, we're going to pick your mom up and take you. He just knew he just instantly mm-hmm. something's not right. And uh, they take me to the hospital. And sure enough, I had a ruptured spleen. And they wow. said if I would have walked from 22nd and Sarnoff to my friend's house, like five blocks away, I would have died of internal bleeding. Yeah, the spleen controls a lot of blood supply. Yeah. That, and, and where's the spleen amazing. located? Because yeah. I'm an idiot. Yeah. Well, he's all about the arm. So, yeah. so right here, you got on your right side is the liver, the gallbladder. On your left side is the spleen. Right oh, it's like here. right under the rib cage. Uh, it's it's kind of tucked under the rib cage, and it's kind of out from under the, uh, the rib Did cage. Did you break a, a rib? I didn't. Oh, so you just hit the spleen straight yeah. on. Yeah. And he could tell you better. It's like an, that's where they hold the excess bag of blood, correct? Yeah, the it's, body it's filters. your body's filtering blood through yeah. that. It stores white blood cells. It stores red blood cells in that area, and so like your liver takes up a lot of blood flow and your spleen is Mm -hmm. a lot of blood flow too. And so, yeah, you can live without a spleen, obviously. (laughs) They they pulled it out, I'm guessing. They didn't. They didn't. They they, repaired it. Yeah, no. They usually just pull that sucker out. They were getting ready to because they were checking to see if the blood was coagulating inside. They were doing blood Uh tests and had me on a a happy trip of morphine. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember every time it would shoot up my arm, it would like, I would have this burning feeling come up and then it was, yeah. you know what I mean? It was crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, they kept watching it and they were getting ready to roll me off into surgery. Mm-hmm. The thing that was really bad at the time too, is my mom had just taken a new job. And at the time, uh, we, I don't think we had health insurance oh. and she was a single mom. Yeah. Wow. That's rough. So the bill was astronomical. Oh yeah. Uh, and they're getting ready to wheel me off to, to take it out, my mm-hmm. spleen. And they said, wait, the platelet level is, is topping off here. And so it just started coagulating enough. They said, you know, we're going to monitor it. So they monitored it and it self-healed. 
That's and awesome. I, and I didn't have to have it removed. Really? Yeah. That's how long, good. How long wow. did it take to heal? It was, I, I want to say it was a course of a couple of days, two to three mm-hmm. days they were monitoring it. That's wow. good. Yeah. Is that normal? Like for your spink to heal that quickly? Um, so far as the healing goes, uh, if you're, if you're young and healthy, yeah, absolutely. But, um, more times than not, once you damage it, it's one of those things that it just doesn't stop bleeding because of how much blood flow it has. So you, you're one of the, uh, fortunate people that get to keep theirs bleeding. Yeah. You know, Justin. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. Justin had that bad biking accident in Taiwan. Same thing, ruptured spleen. Really? He did not have morphine. In oh, Taiwan. Boy. Yeah, but oh my it, God. it can happen to people in a lot of those traumatic incidents where you're. Yeah, I'm, all in your dude, I'm so lucky I didn't damage mine when I flipped on mor- my motorcycle. What? Oh yeah, yeah. Dude, I, I never I, heard I, this oh. story. I heard you had flipped your mo- motorcycle, but I didn't hear how it happened. Well, I, I, actually, I was in the process of joining the Coast Guard. Wow. Yeah, like I had, mm-hmm. I was going to join the police department here, but I was like, wait, I want to get like a resume, mm-hmm. you know, and military is always like something great for people to, you know, build up their resume yep. and, and experience. And, and it gives you better chances when you apply for yeah. like, you know, um, border patrol, police, you know, stuff like that, even firefighters. So I, um, I, I was, I went out to Phoenix, talked to the recruiter, you know, I was in the best shape of my life at the time. I was probably down to like 215. Yeah, I remember you got ripped. You were doing P90X. I was doing P90X. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, is a great, I, I just, I'm so done with that because of the guy's voice, you know, and the way he talks is just like, dude, shut up. Let me work out. Dude's name is Tony or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He's just so like And all happy. the sayings he'd have, you know, yeah. the yeah. same tank tops. P90 too. excellence or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Like just, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to stop. We're actually <laughs> discouraged. It felt like a cult, you know, <laughs> after a while you're like, dude, you shut up. You know, anyways, like, this is Steve and this is Karen. And <laughs> they're all fit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> anyways, so I was, I was doing really well. Um, I had told my wife, hey, we're going to be gone for four years, five years max, and then come back. You know, I was going to get out and then do this. And so I thought, dude, like, this is what God wants me to do because everything was falling in place, you know. Mm-hmm. And it was my friend's birthday party. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go to his, uh, the restaurant. My wife was going to stay home. And so I, I jump on the motorcycle. And I'm literally like, I just left the house. I was like, Five minutes down the road on um i lived on uh, first in fort low so i was like literally on the way and i'm paying attention you know i wasn't driving recklessly i, I usually don't you know i didn't uh, at that time and so i'm paying attention and the person in front of me just slams on their brakes mm-hmm. oh. oh man and that's what you got to watch out for most of the time when yeah. you're on a motorcycle yeah. is other people yes you could be a, a safe driver right follow all the rules be careful but you can't control other people, you know? And so dude, I instinct. I just, I just squeeze the handlebars, man. Um, and literally like the whole bike just like ejects me off. Oh man. You know, I go over the, over the, the handlebars. I land on my face and I had a helmet on, which is Mm -hmm. what like saved my face. (laughs) It didn't just save your face. It saved your life. I'll tell you why. It saved my life. I was going probably about, uh, 30, 35. That's fast. Yeah. On a motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. And to instantly stop. And so I stop. I don't hit the car. The helmet hits and the helmet goes down and I hear a crack. Oh. And I thought it was my neck. But my whole body after that slams on the street like I'm 215 pounds, 220 slamming on the on the on the asphalt, you know. And the only thing that went through my mind was please don't run me over. The guy behind me. So I just go like this, dude. (laughs) I was, I was so scared and, um, I had headphones on. My music was still going. It was like Lecrae or something. (laughs) And I was just like, and they didn't hit. They stopped. I looked around. I was like, I had my, I had just turned my GoPro on too. No, I think I turned it off. I don't remember, Mm. but, um, I didn't catch it on, on, I was like, where's the footage? footage? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But what I did was I, I went for my phone. Um, I called my wife. I said, um, Hey, I crashed. I'm on the floor. I'm okay. I'm alive. Mm. And she, she's like, okay, I'm on my way, you know? And, um, I didn't know, I didn't, I heard a crack, but I didn't know what it was. So instantly I just checked my toes, my ankles, my knee. I was like, okay, I can move those. I was like, my legs aren't broken. That's great. Mm -hmm. And then I sat up, asked somebody to help me up. And somebody's like, no, don't help him. You know, you're not supposed to, (laughs) you're not supposed to move. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he helped me up. Right. And then I go like this to lift myself up and I just, I couldn't lift up. I was like, what 
the heck? And I was like, my, it was my clavicle. Uh-huh. Mm. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, put any pressure in helping my body up. So I was like, oh, and you can feel it right now. It's still, it's like this, you know, <laughs> it, it, it broke. And so the helmet went down and hit the clavicle when I hit the floor. So the helmet, the edge of the helmet is what broke my clavicle, Wow, you know, but it saved yeah, my yeah. life, you know, that's crazy, man. Yeah. That, that's, uh, so with, whenever it comes to motorcycles, like there, I have more than enough stories too, too many stories about, about motorcycle accidents whenever I was an EMT. Cause man, I mean, it's, it is the, it, and he's absolutely right. You could be the safest motorcycle, you know, uh, rider whatsoever. But the problem is, is everybody else for some reason, right. you you need to give them the same amount of breadth, the same amount of space as a car, treat them like a car, but people don't. And right. and so you have people trying to skirt around them on the road or what have you. It just becomes a mess. And I've seen motorcycle versus bear going 55 miles an hour. Oh I've seen motorcycle uh, versus uh, one of those, you know, the, the old school, like tall, uh, street lamp posts that are oh, yeah. made out of wood, you know, the, like the wood beam ones. <laughs> so motorcycle going 65, 70 versus that. And the only ones who live are the ones who wear a helmet. Wow. Anybody, anybody. That's and, how my, my aunt and her uh, fiance died. They were on a motorcycle mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they got hit by, uh, actually the person was illegal and he was drunk and he hit them and they were gone. He got extradited. Nothing happened. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. that's usually what happens in those situations. Yeah. But I, I actually, yeah, the motorcycle versus bear was interesting because it was a real rural area where I was at, where I was an EMT and we covered a huge amount of area. And, uh, so it's this large amount of straight highway. Mm-hmm. So this dude's just chugging along going, everybody went like at least 15 over the speed limit in that area. There was no cops. It was in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And it was also really mm-hmm. low elevation. And there's no reason that a bear should be there. And sure enough, bear starts walking across the road. And How big was this bear, dude? This bear was, it was like a, I would, I wouldn't, I don't know a ton about bears, but it was a brown bear from what I was told. And it was like the equivalent of what a teenager would be in bear years. So it wasn't full size yet. I was like a teenager. <laughs> a teenage bear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Teenage bear. Um, it was. Stinking kids. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so it basically was, you know, this whole, you know, it wasn't full size yet, but it's bigger than you and me, obviously. Mm-hmm. It was about, if all of us put our weight together, it would be about about our size. So wow. it was big. Well, it was big. Probably 600 pounds, 700 yeah, pounds. Yeah, it wasn't, wow. it wasn't quite there yet, but it was, it was getting there and was there anything it was left? fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, the, the bear, bear probably ran away, huh? The bear actually didn't live and it was because oh. it was hit in the neck. Oh, and it would have been a body shot. He probably just went around. Right yeah, off. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the, um, miracle miracles, the patient only had like road rash, really bad road rash, but just road rash. No, oh my broken anything. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And that person had their helmet on. And then the person who was motorcycle versus, uh, versus, you know, telephone pole, um, w- was, uh, completely creamed it was oh my gosh it was it was a sad yeah, sight I, i've i've had a and then and then I, I i i was in a sports bike and then i went to a harley oh nice. and that sports bike was like 320 cc it wasn't even that fast my first mm-hmm. one and then i graduated to 1200 cc harley so wait you get in a wreck and your wife still lets you drive one <laughs> yeah well the thing was this uh, we didn't have a second vehicle so it was oh, it was that just to get around yeah this was a sales pitch babe it's way better on gas there you go and it, was, yeah, it was cheaper too <laughs> but uh so i remember i was going on miracle mile and a car does it again they slam on the brakes but i i was i i learned like use the back tire you know mm. not the front tire and so i just slid out a little bit and then caught myself and everything i survived but then from there i was like I'm done. I was like, I'm done with this. You know, this yeah. it's not worth it. And so we traded in and got the truck. I don't blame you at all, yeah, man. I was like, no, I don't blame you at all. I've, I've seriously debated doing it. And then I was like, mm, I, I can't. And yeah. with all the knowledge and all the times I've seen it go wrong, I was just like, nah, can't. Yeah. You weigh your <laughs> options. Yeah. So, so you're injured seventh grade. Yeah. Right. 
Also, I meant to say um, blockbuster video, not Best Buy. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's really, he's really thinking back <laughs> far now. Oh my gosh. He's like, I can't believe I said it best. I can't I don't believe that. <laughs> this guy ruptured his spleen. I was like, I was and born I said, in the 90s, but that's about I did. it. I, I said Nintendo 64 when they asked me for a uh, an oh, 80s no. video game. And yeah. I was like, I'm sorry. I was born in the 90s, bro. Like, uh, yeah, like. Oh, I think yeah. it would have just, the right answer would have been flat Nintendo no 64. It's mm-hmm. either, yeah, but you said Atari, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Atari. Someone, showing someone shot at Atari. I can't remember. Was Nintendo 80s or was it 90s? Nintendo was 80s and 90s. Okay, it was late 80s then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, going back, I ruptured my spleen. And so I was doing really poorly in school. It was the, mm-hmm. the summer before that, I went and stayed with my uncle in California. And he was just a couple years older than me. And so, uh, so you know, I got into drugs and alcohol very, very early mm-hmm. in life. Mm-hmm. What type of drugs were you doing? So at that time, it was uh, just pot, just, you know, smoking yeah. weed. and Gateway. And drinking gateway drug, yeah. So... That happened, and then uh, I was doing poorly in school anyway, but because I was out of school for so long after I ruptured my spleen, I pretty much failed seventh grade. Mm. So I went to a school, uh, it's kind of close to the U of A, it's called Miles. I don't know if it's still there or not, but anyway, I was able to do seventh and eighth grade in one year there, so I kind of caught back up. Wow. And then I went to, uh, my freshman year was at Santa Rita High School here in Tucson, so I was um, there, and that's where all my friends that I grew up with went. And then again, uh, we started just really going off the rails at a really young age. So Mm. I I remember we were sneaking our parents' cars out, right? None of us had driver's licenses. We were drinking and driving. So you were like 15? Not even, bro. We were 14, I guess, freshman year. Driving around, drinking, right? Going to parties or, you know, picking up girls or whatever and sneaking the car back and going back and sleeping and... Uh, well, I remember we were uh, we would ditch school and we'd like break into people's houses that weren't home and steal guns and stuff out of it. I mean, Whoa. I mean, we this is all like East Side kids. You think it's like <laughs> South Side? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. It sounds South Side. Pantano. Yeah. The cops come in, you're like, oh, oh, it's just you guys. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Don't don't let me catch you here again. Yeah, go home. What are you doing? <laughs> Slap the wrist. So thing, things got, they just got out of control. And our parents, I remember they didn't know what to do with us. Like, weren't, weren't these the same kids that were just playing sports last year? And And so- my mom, uh, God bless her, you know, single mom, she's at work and I'm just doing whatever. She mm. didn't tell me what to do when mm-hmm. you're not here, you mm-hmm. know? So she's, she, uh, for her to ask my dad to pick me up and take me was a lot because they, you know, they, this day they don't talk, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So for her to have to humble herself that bad, you know, not being saved or anything and hey, I, I can't handle him anymore. You got to take him. Mm. And, you know, my dad not saved either, being a Christian or whatever. I moved to Prescott, but there was at least a structure there. You know, he was uh, he was there to drop me off, pick me up at school, right. kind of enforce me to, to do the right thing. So, yeah, Prescott was a culture shock, man. You're coming from, like, oh, Tucson, yeah, and it wasn't imagine. the booming metropolis it is now. I mean, like, Prescott Valley, Chino Valley were just, like, trailers and stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I come from being kind of a city kid from Tucson to... Yeah. Old people in Subarus. Yeah, <laughs> people Subaru and uh, just lying on when I, Cowboys when I, ranches. I've gone out to Prescott Conference a few times, Prescott Conference a few times, and I'm just like, there's nothing here. <laughs> I, thought there, I thought there was nothing in Tucson. There's nothing there. It's just houses. Oh, dude. And I there's even, traffic, and you're like, wait, it's just because they're slow. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going on an invasion team with this guy. And mm. the whole time was one big joke. It was just, it was oh great. Gosh. It kept me really entertained. <laughs> yeah, it was, was that uh, Georgia? No, we went to uh, Washington. Washington State. Oh, that was, I loved Washington, man. The yeah, weather. This is amazing. Yeah, it was fun. Back in my days when I still, you know, dyed my hair black, had hair, <laughs> dyed my hair black, wore like a bunch of dark clothing all the time. And <laughs> if there yeah. was a phase, Stuart went through it <laughs> for <Wow>. everything. <laughs> uh, just a little, just a little. Yeah, mine was, uh, you know, it just a big culture shock. And I really, I had no common ground to make friends at all. I remember my friends telling me, hey, if you want to make friends, make sure you talk to people. I was like, mm. He's got, these guys all wore cowboy boots and cowboy hats in school. I just could not get it at all. But so I just kind of focused on my grades. One of the few times in my life I did that. And we, you know, it was high elevation. So I would, I would take up running and stuff and kind of got in good shape. And then the deal was, if I did well, I could decide where I wanted to live Mm -hmm. at the end of that year. So I I did. And, you know, all my friends are in Tucson. There's nothing in Prescott. It was a no brainer for me. I was like, I'm coming back. And so... 
and then uh, that's when things, you know, I really, really took drugs to the next level. Mm. And uh, it, was, it wasn't just pot, but it was pot all day long, morning, lunch, night. I mean, several times a day. It was to the point where I wasn't even getting high anymore. I would just do it to actually feel normal. Wow. It was a real deprived state, you know, and uh, just didn't know any better. I mean, this is just who I ran with. This is what I did. And we started mm-hmm. getting into uh, acid, mushrooms. Uh, you have some crazy trips on those? Yeah, yeah, lots of them. And it, they, what's, what happened was they ended up getting worse and worse. So I can think of a couple uh, that were real bad. And this was going on to years of, of using hallucinogenics. Now, I remember I started end of high school. So now I'm a few years into the military and we're dropping acid and, and doing mushroom. There was one particular time I remember uh, we had a big bag of mushrooms. There's like five of us. And so we all ate a bunch of them. And so we're- What do they taste th- like? Uh- a good question like dirt <laughs> they don't taste good yeah <laughs> <laughs> they don't taste it's kind of a slimy feel and it's weird it's not like a mushroom that you'd eat from the grocery store either it's like poop mm-hmm. uh, i don't know i've never eaten poop <laughs> i could tell i was well, I, I, he I, set I, me up for that one he's like no i hear a lot of <laughs> mushrooms are they come from the feces out in the wild that's what i hear it's like they grow underneath like they say cow pastures is yeah. the place to pick them so i never picked them i mean we bought them from right. people and and, just, and, but the source essentially is from that and uh-huh. so i i hear that it has a lot of that flavors but a lot of people won't know what to associate it with because right. no you're not out there eating poop you know what i mean <laughs> but that's what i hear because it's a fungus you know it is so it, they definitely don't taste good uh, i remember that they don't taste good so we're at this lake it's exeter rhode island is where we were and so uh we ate a we ate a bunch of them and then all of a sudden someone was, they had a car, it sounded like, a, like a, a, a souped up car and they revved on the engine. And in that moment of time, you know, and we grew up here on, on the border, right? Nogales mm-hmm. is here. So you know, about you guys in high school, we'd go to Nogales all the time and party. And, and I heard some guys speaking Spanish and then the engine, the, and the, the rev of the engine. And all of a sudden I'm in my mind, I'm behind the border. We're being chased by, uh, you know, the Naval, uh, Naval security Gosh. services trying to catch us. And I remember looking at everybody and my eyes must've been like this big. And I said, they're never going to catch me a lot. And I grabbed <laughs> the, the only backpack we had full of the, it had the car keys in it, everyone's IDs. And I go running off into the woods, like a oh, madman, no. no shirt on and a bottle of water. Right. And I'm just <laughs> running. And it's, it, you know, it, I, we laugh. It, it was so real to me. Oh yeah. I bet. It was so real. And, uh, and so I'm running and I find this, I ran to no, like middle of nowhere. I find that it was, and it was in the fall because all the leaves were falling there. And I take the backpack and I shove it in the middle of this pile of leaves and I cover it up because it had our car keys in it. It had all of our ID. So I was trying to bury our ID so, so they, they couldn't, couldn't find ID you. who we were. <laughs> and then I come back and they're like, oh, and all my friends are there. They're like, what happened to him? You know, and then I come back like, oh, thank God you're all right. What did you do? What did you do? I said, don't worry. They're never going to find out. Who we are. <laughs> I'm so serious, man. And I mean, this just shows how out of your mind you are. Yeah. They're like, what are you talking about? I was like, oh, I, I buried our IDs. They're never going to find them. Like, you what? <laughs> I said, what are our car keys in there? Yeah. You go find them right now. Go find them. <laughs> and so the crazy thing is you can be this disillusioned out of your mind, you know, tripping. Yeah. I walked right back to where they were and I unburied the <laughs> leaves, grabbed the backpack and came back. <laughs> So I got right here. Wow. Oh, that's so your brain had a mental map of where they were <laughs> yeah. in the midst of all that. All that insanity. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. And so that was kind of the beginning of the end for me because that, that happened. And there was one other time I remember, uh, you know, and they were all laughing about it, like, man, you were out of your mind, you know. And so there was another time we were on base and we were doing acid on base. And we were little <laughs> barracks, right? Oh, my God. We were, yeah, we were not together at all. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, so... Uh, I'm, I just start to feel the effects of the high or whatever. And I walk outside and there's just a squat car sitting at the edge of the barracks with its lights on it. Who knows? It probably just pulled somebody over. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Paranoid delusion. They're coming to get me, you know? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I run into my room. I turn off all the lights. It's like in the middle of the day, you know? <laughs> and I'm like hiding like under my bed, like under a blanket. And there are, my friends are like knocking. I'm like, hey, what are you doing in there? What are you doing in there? I was like, no, leave me alone. I'm not here. I'm not here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh my god. I'm going to go to sleep. They're like, you're, and they started laughing. I'm like, you're I'm on acid. Sleep. You can't sleep on acid. <laughs> you know, and, I'm like, and so I started having these real bad, it wasn't, again, it wasn't fun anymore. It's not you laughing yeah. with your friends. Mm-hmm. I'm having these legit, like paranoid delusions. And uh, I, 
years later, I, I'd heard about people that have gone on trips like this and they never came back. Yeah. And to mm-hmm. them, it's just as real in their mind and they never came back. They're in that. So, the when, you were, state. so when you were in that state, you, you always felt like someone was coming for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's almost like the, I don't know if it was the guilt, the, just knowing you're doing wrong and your conscience finally trying to get away into yeah. you. Like, Hey, what are you doing? You know, I, I don't know what it was. I mean, yeah. being an RN, you probably have a better medical well, perspective of what that really is. But so, so the thing is, is whenever it comes down to it, I've seen a lot of the people, I, I deal with a lot of people who never come down. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I do deal with some people who come down from the high or whatever. Um, Cause we, we, we run detoxes as well and help, you know, people get off of drugs. And so it's really what it comes down to is, is how your brain chemistry is made up. There's so much about the brain we don't understand. Mm-hmm. And so that's why some people can have these breaks where they're just gone forever. Um, and then sometimes they're, they're not. If you're talking about it, from, you know, from a science perspective, it's kind of like the medical community is like, okay, it can happen, but we don't uh, completely understand mm-hmm. why. Um, but honestly, like, seeing like so you know science and then spirituality right Right. and so um i've had experiences with some of these people where they've done an extensive amount of drugs and you know not not just pot you know extensive uh, meth and acid and what what have you mushrooms um and uh the interesting part of those people who don't come back down is it seems like they like open this spiritual door where they can mm. see and hear and feel these paranoid delusions all the time. And I've, I've had people talking, like looking at people, but they're not there and having conversations where they're switching from conversation to conversation. And every one of these imaginary people is accusing them of something and they're defending themselves all day. Can you imagine how exhausting that would be? Wow. Mm. Yeah. You know, I've had, mm. I've had it where, they get so stimulated from these these situations and circumstances and they know things they shouldn't know. Like, you know, those people who are, I, I had a patient who's getting overstimulated and, you know, we're going to have to give a, a what's called a chemical restraint because they're becoming a danger to themselves or others um, while they're on the unit and go to give a, a medication called Geodon, which is a, a very helpful antipsychotic medication which usually, they, they would have no idea. Yeah, and this is the thing. We also don't ki- typically give it. Um, we usually give what's called a B-52, which is Ativan, Haldol, and Benadryl. See, I don't and, even know these names. <laughs> Benadryl, I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Benadryl, Benadryl. Count yourself blessed. Yeah, yeah. You don't know yeah. what they <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and a B-52 is just, um, Haldol is an antipsychotic, so it helps, it helps their brain um, just kind of calm down. And mm-hmm. then, uh, the Ativan is an anti-anxiolytic. So it helps with the anxiety that's going on from the stimulation they're getting mm-hmm. in their brain. And then the Benadryl is there to actually, because it's very common for people to get, um, uh, you know, an allergic type reaction with Haldol. So uh, it's actually there to, to help counter. with the allergy to counteract, counteract that as well as Drowsy. it makes you tired. Yeah. 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 So mm-hmm. all makes three of those put together is what we usually give. Well, this patient in particular was extra stimulated and the doctor called for Geodon on top of that, including that into the B52. And uh, so we go to give the medications. And when they're that at, at, at that point, we just... It, it's not an option anymore. It's called a chemical restraint for a reason. Like right. they're going to get the shot. It's not asking it's, we have to do it because they're so dangerous at that point. And so we go to give the shot and the person just looks me dead in the eye and says, don't give us Geodon. And I just got chills down my spine. Like first off, how did you know? And second off, who's us? Like <laughs> what, who, who's us? You're, you're one person here. And yeah, those kinds of, we don't we like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Stewart's and, an RN by the way. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Work in a psych facility. He's not making this up. <laughs> yeah. Or this real. Real. <laughs> but yeah, these situations, there's a certain element where you're like, okay, yeah, the physical world. And they, they did a lot of, a lot so, of drugs, so what did but you then do? it opens up that, that spiritual side that you're just like, okay, that I know, you know, that's when, that, when, just, when, 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 rebuke when he or she <laughs> said this, maybe they were both, but, uh, what did you do? Like, uh, honestly, in that situation, I just, I, I at that point I said, I said, I said, well, I did say, I said, <laughs> well, first off, how do you know that to try to check, to make sure it's not an actual allergy. I, I wanted to know oh. if this was a patient that's saying this or if it's, you know, the other personalities saying right. this and, uh, and, um, and then, you know, 
the patient just kept staring at me and saying, don't give us. And I'm like, okay, so we're so delusional at this point that it's not an allergy. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. And, and, and honestly, it was super effective. It was super effective. And the patient was the most docile and clear minded that I had seen them in a while. I, you, as you're giving it to them, you should have been like, I repeat, can they <laughs> I was definitely thinking that. That's for sure. <laughs> I imagine, you know, I graduated high school on time or barely, but I did. So I ended up graduating and I had an older friend of mine. Uh, he's like an older brother to me and he had joined the Navy and he had already joined and come back and encouraged me. He said, you know, Pete, if you stay here in Tucson, you're going to end up in jail. You're going to end up dead. Uh, you're just going to be no one, you know, and I had no psych ward. Yeah. And I I had no (laughs) drive or ambition to do anything in life, Mm. but not to go to school. He said, you know, the one thing you can do on the, when you're in the Navy is he's like, I was on these aircraft carriers and they would take off over my head all night. I I couldn't uh, sleep, but you're out there at night and you, there's nothing you see but the ocean. And you really, you think about what you want to do with your life. So, uh, so that, that appealed to me, you know? So anyway, I'll fast forward. I ended up joining the Navy and for the first couple of years, everything went great. Uh, I, was, I was in the medical field. I was a corpsman mm-hmm. in the Navy. I liked what I did. It was, you know, helping take care of people. And uh, a few years in, you know, things are doing well. But the only problem is that I went with myself. And so all the old habits that I was involved mm-hmm. in, you know, getting high, drinking. Now, now it's a, the stakes are much higher. You're in the military. It's yeah. zero tolerance. They don't play. And so, uh, you know, I didn't want to get in trouble. But at the same time, it's just that's who you are. It's what you do. You know, it's. So what sin is, it's your culture. It's not mm. uh, something you just do and, and get out of. It's a part of who you are now. Mm. It's, you know, the, what does the Bible say? It's uh, he who sins is a slave to sin, right? Mm-hmm. And that's so true. I couldn't quit. I wanted to. I just couldn't. Anyway, so I'm in. I, I have a five-year obligation. I, I do about three years. I go to a party one night. It was a Super Bowl party. I ended up doing quite a bit of drinking. And then someone pulled out a joint. And I ended up getting high. And it's all hours of the morning now. It's a Sunday night. So I report to my duty station Monday morning and I get hit with a urinalysis. Hey, you got to go. That yeah. day? Whoa. We're talking hours, bro. Yeah. Yeah, like. You're done. Yeah. Did they know? <laughs> or they were just random checks? They were doing random checks for a while, but like all my friends and I were just, you know, foolish. We, they, and they would give you till noon. So we get to work at 630 and we're drinking water all day. Well, guess what? Everyone's urine's yellow. Ours is like crystal clear, like water. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm athletic. I run. Yeah, right. right? So, yeah. so they started doing smaller groups purposely for that to try to catch people because they knew, you know, it was a small command. Word got around. Mm. So they had me right there. So I have to report. And so we did. Uh, I was also uh, helping assist with surgeries and we would do those surgeries off the naval hospital because it was all clinics where I was. So mm. there was a hospital out in town, a civilian hospital. So I told someone, hey, cover for me. Tell them that I'm assisting in surgery and I'll be here by noon to buy myself time. Right. Someone from security had already seen me on the compound that morning. So they knew that wasn't true. So she mm. calls in and they're like, what's this guy hiding? So I, I didn't know what to do. I confided in my supervisor and I said, hey, you know, can you cover for me till noon? Just to, and he's like, hey, you gonna have a problem with this drug test? Is that, is that the issue? So I confided in him, I said, yeah. He's like, yeah, I wish you hadn't told me. I need to go and report you right now. <sighs> so he was walking to security. Security was walking towards the clinic to come find me. <laughs> so I mean, it, it just went from bad to worse to worse to worse. I mean, yeah, you so de-escalated. The end goal, yeah, it just boom. Were you cool with your supervisor or yeah, very cool? Oh, so you trusted him very much. Yeah, but he did his job right. And yeah. so uh, he comes back wow. like minutes later, and he's like, "Yeah, they're looking for you." I told him I had to bring you in right now. So he walks me over there. I give my sample. And the doctor that I worked for in the clinic uh, was very, very good to me and a real high ranking guy. I mean, he took me under his wing and I really felt, I felt horrible. Like I had really let him down more than anything. Yeah. You know? The guy just gave me a chance. So, so he, that, that, the captain finds out that I worked for him. He's like, put him down in the eyeglass lab because I was working with patients. So I was just in this rat infested lab, like grinding eyeglasses, <laughs> waiting for my drug test to come back. So what makes it even worse is that was one test, right? Uh, a couple days later, they gave me another drug test. And then another, the next day, they gave me another one. So the writing was on the wall. I mean, they knew yeah. they had me. They just wanted to lock down the evidence, make sure, hey, this guy's not going anywhere. So it was at that time, uh, I was uh, dating a girl. And uh, her mom was a very, very religious woman. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm just broken. I mean, I realized I've ruined the only good thing I had going in my life. I'm going to go back to Tucson. I'm going to face my mom and tell her, yeah, I left here because I was on drugs. Now I'm back here because I'm on drugs. Right. Mm-hmm. 
just a complete well, failure. Because of like just one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, so you were clean this entire time while you were in the military and then you're like, ah, okay. no, no, I wasn't. Oh, you weren't? No. I didn't. <laughs> oh. Did they sneak stuff onto the boat and stuff? No. So I was at a shore command the oh, whole time okay. actually. So it was like kind of having a job, you know, right. we'd go to the clinic Monday through Friday, we had the weekends off. It was pretty easy as far as military mm-hmm. duty goes, Yeah. but it was a small command and there was nothing for young kids to do to get in trouble if they right. were, should choose, choose to do so. So. So I have all these tests and uh, she, she says, she's talking to her mom about me and she said, hey, my mom told me to tell you that you need to ask Jesus into your heart. Oh. I had no idea what that meant. Yeah. Uh, I went to church when I was a kid here and there. I, I always believed in God, mm-hmm. but you know, I was the furthest thing from a Christian and I knew that. And, and how old were you at this? Uh, I was in my uh, early, early 20s at the time. I had no idea what that meant. At all. Wow. So what happens, she tells me that, and a lot of people were telling me all kinds of stuff. Hey, keep your head up, you know, this right. and that. And then it all went one ear out the other, but ask Jesus in your heart. Just kept kind of repeating my head. So I'm in this lab, I'm grinding glasses and everybody goes to lunch and I'm sitting there and I just broke. And I just began weeping like a baby. And I just cried out to God. I didn't know how to pray, but I said, God, if you're real, please come into my heart and just forgive me. I don't want to live life like this anymore. Yeah. I'm really sorry for what I've done. And if you can forgive someone like me, please do it. And in that moment, I didn't know what it was, but I felt this weight. Just like literally, it felt like it lifted off my, my, my body. Like this weight was on my chest. It was just mm-hmm. gone. Wow. And uh, I, just, I don't know. I just could tell I was not alone in that room. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what had happened. So uh, six weeks later, all three drug tests came back completely clean. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, and that's what I, and I was like, why, like, how does that work? Like, and yeah. then I, I thought, okay, so God's real, but why? I didn't deserve yeah. that. I should have got kicked out. Yeah. Why? And you, you, you confessed to <laughs> doing drugs, that you were gonna be dirty, Which is right? Crazy. No, I, I didn't confess to anybody. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> no, I, I knew that much. I didn't know a lot, but I knew that much. So, oh, they, that, I mean, they had me right yeah, there, and yeah, it was yeah. obvious you're trying to skirt around this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and I just, I kept my mouth shut. But the thing was, is right after this happened, there was a, I had this 12 string guitar, and I didn't know how to tune it, but there was a guy in the barracks that knew how, and he was always inviting me up to church, mm. and it just wasn't my thing. You know, I was mm-hmm. partying and girls or whatever, so. But I saw him in the grocery store not too long after this happened. And I said, uh, hey, you're the one that was always inviting me to church, right? And he said, yeah. yeah. I said, well, let me tell you what happened. And he said, man, God is really trying to get a hold of you. Why don't you come to church with me? So I said, yeah, I, I finally said, Dang, said I'm going to go to church. So wild. we go to church. It's like 45 minutes away from the base. And it's a church, a pioneer church in our fellowship. Nice. Where, where is this? About, it's in Warwick, Rhode Island. Oh it's my about gosh. like 45 minutes away from where I was, like, about five to 10 people. Do you the remember the pastor's state? name? Yeah, yeah, the, the pastor, United state. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the smallest state. You know, and the crazy thing too is that uh, living in Tucson, I mean, big fellowship church here, never heard mm-hmm. the gospel once. Mm, yeah. Lived in Prescott for a whole year. I think one time, this is when the church was across from the high school. Mm-hmm. Someone may have given me one of those Green New Testaments and asked me if I was going to heaven. I, that's the closest thing I can remember to a witness in Tucson or Prescott. Wow. But here in Rhode Island, you know, so far away. It's mm. crazy because, well, first of all, the, the moral of the story is um, if you want to get out of a drug test, accept <laughs> right. Christ in your heart. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I've heard it go it's the other way from other people. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's yeah. crazy because God, God's timing is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And you were in the, uh, what do they call it, epicenter yeah. of, of our fellowship. Like you were in the the place. If if it was ever gonna happen to anybody, it would happen to you there, Prescott or Tucson. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, absolutely. And God's like, no, not yet. Yeah. No, not yet. And then when that time where you needed Him most is when God found you. And <laughs> yeah. that's an excellent point that you bring up there because what I'm starting to notice, like, it, looking looking on life, is every single person who comes to Christ has a defining moment that they can point back to and say that was when I needed him. Yeah. Even and if they're I, a church kid. Yeah, yeah. Even if they're a church kid, they grew up in it their whole life. I did. Michael did. But the difference is, is like, that doesn't mean you have that personal relationship. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. there's always some time, some point, like I have my reference point very mm-hmm. clear in my head. And the second I said that everyone in this room knew the defining moment, whenever God waits, I, I really believe God waits for that moment to go, mm-hmm. okay, here's your choice. Knock, knock. Do you want me to come in or not? Right. And then boom, yeah. if you make that choice at that point, you know, you, you turn down the right path. You're never the same after that. Yeah. There's no way you could go back. 
Like right. at that point, you knew. Like yeah. you knew how you'd been living was wrong, but you didn't. You know, you probably were just like, oh, this is what the kids do. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't. There's no one ever saying like this is the reason that's wrong. Right. It's all you but know. Then you know. What's, what's crazy is the contrast here is is you didn't know nothing about God, and he was a pastor's kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And God still has His timing. Like no one is exempt. Right. From needing God. And how far God goes for us, too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like before we even had the choice, yeah. his only son was given for us. I was thinking about that on the way here. You know, I have three children. I have one son. And it's like, you know, for one of us to maybe jump in front of that car for someone else, mm-hmm. but to forsake your own son. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I, that love is on a, such a different level. I can't even c- comprehend that. Mm-hmm. And I thank God I didn't have to. I just accepted it and yeah. it transformed my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's a love like no other. And that's if people will look beyond, you know, and see the relational value, like you were saying, is mm. that God, God let his own son take yeah. that wrath for us and forsook him for us. Mm-hmm. And that's the crazy thing is like, if you take it all the way back to creation, like Pastor Garrett talks about this all the time, is that God created humanity to have a relationship with him. Like that's a part of that creation, obviously to glorify him, but that's a part of that relationship. So he's willing to give a piece of himself up so he can restore that relationship that sin is violated. Mm. So powerful. So it's like God finds you in those moments, restores you so he can have a relationship with you just like, you know, he did for Adam and Eve. So you, you accept Christ in your life. You're in a fellowship church. What does God do now? Like, so your life was pretty much jacked up, right? Yeah. You had all these addictions, all these desires and, so how did God... You just so, matrix out of drug tests? You know what I mean? Like, so, so what, what happened next? Well, the first thing you have to mention is the, the command I was a part of. They're thinking, what the heck happened? We had this guy right here. How are these clean? How are these drug tests <laughs> clean? Quota. So yeah, so they're like thinking, does this test even work? You know, we, if you could ever have a guy like as red-handed as me. And so they're all looking at me now because basically clean slate, no, nothing happened to me. I didn't get in trouble. You know, so I'm back re- yeah. reinstated. If anything, they thought you were crazy. Right. And you know that scripture <laughs> yeah, Isaiah, come is to me, come to me, though your sins are as red as scarlet, I'll make you as white as snow. Like almost instantaneously. Yeah, I'm back literally. in the clinic, I'm working up patients, just like nothing ever. And they're all the high ups, you know, the officers will walk by and they'd scowl. And, mm. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> yeah. And so so what happens is that's the first part. So this is there's this huge wow factor that I was just completely beside myself. And so uh uh, to kind of back up before I saw that guy in the grocery store, um, my birthday was a couple months after that. And I remember I went out and I was just, I went out with the, I remember I, I had yet to hear the gospel go to church or anything. I just said, Hey, I'm just going to go have a couple beers. So a couple, I do a couple more and I didn't do drugs or anything, but I did some very foolish things that I immediately regretted. And I remember mm. I, I looked at what had happened that night. I woke up the next morning and I said, look at what God did. And I'm no better for it. Mm. And I remember just feeling like kind of condemned, like, God, what is it going to take for me to finally change? Like, I'm still the Mm. same guy here. Like, and I knew that was a miracle. No one could convince me otherwise, Mm. but that's all I knew. So then, you know, I met the guy, he brings me out to church. Church freaked me out because, (laughs) you know, what happens during worship, everyone's again praying, you know, worshiping God, the Holy Ghost praying and telling, and there's like five people here, you know, and I'm like, Mm-mm. So you're, <laughs> you're literally like a shiny new toy. Yeah. And all these people are like, okay, this is the visitor, obviously. Right. Well, yeah. And not only that, but like you're with five other people that are like speaking this other language you don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> hey, but so they don't know the language either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, but the, but the one thing that kept me was the preaching was, it was almost like, as they say, it's like, you know, they read your mail or whatever, but it was mm-hmm. just like the stuff that was coming over. No one there knew me. They didn't know my story, but everything that was coming over the pulpit was just right for me. Yeah. And I was like, oh my He's like, God. you cheated a drug test <laughs> <laughs> three times. <laughs> that was not twice, but three. <laughs> yeah. Oh crap! They're so like, oh, they're on to me, man. Yeah, this is oh, really boy, a NCIS right here. <laughs> <laughs> they they're going to get me to confess one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but but really, there was a, there was a radical transformation right after that. Mm. Um, I didn't uh, didn't chase any girls anymore. A uh, short time later, I completely gave up drinking never touch drugs again from that point on. Wow. Wow. I have a yeah. question for you. Yes. Um, cause a lot of people think and believe that drinking is not a sin. Mm-hmm. So when you gave up drinking, what was the reason for it? Was it mainly for what it led to or was it because you were convinced that this was wrong? Mm. 
it was because of what it led to. I know plenty of people, uh, mm-hmm. they, you know, they have a couple of beers and, and that's all it is to it. And they say that's a sin. Uh, I, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it, and, and the Bible, you know, doesn't clearly state, you know what right. I mean? So that's, that's, that's why I brought it up because there's a lot of confusion or uh, it is, it isn't. And so I, there is, but, but the thing is, is what I wanted to mention was it's what it leads to. Exactly. And I think that's the bigger issue is like mm-hmm. God knows certain people like, hey, you cannot control yourself mm-hmm. when you are drinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because to me, two always led to two more. And some mm-hmm. people, two is two. You know, and I, it's kind of like my conviction now. If I yeah. go to some, like I, I still have friends that I keep in touch with that aren't mm-hmm. saved. <clears throat> and if I'm at their house and they have a couple of beers or there's a couple of people, I'm fine with it. It's when people start getting like knocked down drunk, I'm, I'm out of there. Because then right. people start right. saying stuff that they don't mean and things can get real messy. And, right. Right. and they always that's when they really want to talk about God. Not when they mean it, but because they're loose and full of juice, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to this day, that's kind of my standard is if, you know, people are having a couple of drinks, I really don't care. But if it goes beyond that. But yeah, for me, it's exactly okay. what you said okay. is two goes to two more. And then before it, I'm on the floor. You know? Yeah. So. I mean, even like for me, it's like I reference it to like how it's destroyed parts of my family, you mm-hmm. know, like my, you know, my parents and their parents and their experiences and our extended family. You know, you just, you, you see its destruction. Yeah. And you're like, why would I even open that door? Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Wise yeah, it's the same for me. I mean, I grew up, like I said, in that childhood. I remember being a kid and my my mom's cousins were giving me cups of Alizé, which is like a liquor, mm-hmm. but flavored liquor and like hypnotic. These are like cholo liquors, like <laughs> thugs, you know? <laughs> but they were giving me cups of it as I'm playing my video game. Mm-hmm. And I am i don't even think twice. I just start drinking it. <laughs> and it tastes good. It's strong. But here I am, 10 years old, drinking that is literally what, like, once I became a Christian, I didn't have any, like, um, reservations of, of not wanting to do that because I was forced into it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't something that I wanted. It was just given mm-hmm. to me because, oh, we're doing it, so you have to do it. Or, oh, that's funny, huh? Let's give this kid some liquor. Mm-hmm. And so that's, like you said, your family, that's part of the same reason for me where I'm just like, no, I'm not going to touch it. Even when I get invited, when I used to get invited to family gatherings, since I voted for Trump, you know, my family's just like, <laughs> bro, I got called out on Facebook oh, wow. for oh, yeah? being like a Mexican hater and all oh, this stuff. And by your cussing, family? By my cousin. Oh, nice. Out cussing me out. And uh, he's like, I'm just posting this here so the whole family knows. <laughs> yeah. And so wow. I probably won't get invited anywhere anymore, but. Sorry, you um, come to my house, Miguel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, that's why whenever my family is, you know, at the uh, gatherings, they're drinking. I'm like, I'm good. Mm-hmm. Do, don't you leave. think? Do you guys think too that that's a true mark of a, of a real conversion of someone that really has an encounter with Jesus versus, and, and not to knock twelve step programs. I know that they help a lot of people mm-hmm. and stuff. So no, no knocking that at all. But the difference between a conversion and someone who's told not to. Right. Hey, you shouldn't do this because X is where. The conversion mark is that your desires begin to change. Yeah, well, yes, and you can that's and it, you can right. just like it's like the gates open and you can just walk out. It's not right. like you're been told oh, get out of there. It's just no, 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 no. I'm done. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a mark. Old things have passed away. Therefore, all shall be made new. So if well that's a habit or that's a part of your old life, then it should be separated. Right, right. and that's the thing. Like when it comes down to it, for me, like so uh, I. So it's it's one of those things where whenever, you know, you're a church kid and then you're a pastor's kid on top of that, you have a lot of rules, mm-hmm. a lot of rules that you have to live by. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right. but it's all imposed by your parents and it's imposed by people at church who think that somehow you should be held to this higher standard. Mm-hmm. And so in that process, I got really rule focused, like mm-hmm. my entire childhood through my teen years, it wasn't it wasn't this personal relationship. Right. And so it's marked by being told not to like what you said. And if you focus on those rules, you end up in a situation where you're like me at 18 years old, go out and do your own thing. And I, I resented being a pastor's kid. If I'm being honest, like I resented it. And I was, I was an angry young man. I was also, you know, out there, you know, doing my own thing. And the entire time, the entire time, it wasn't, I wasn't denying God. I wasn't saying I didn't believe it. I believed all of it still. I, I knew it was the truth. You can't ever unknow that. You know what I mean? But it was just one of those things where I never, I never got what a personal relationship meant. And a personal relationship, like I now know what that is. It, it clicked. And until that clicks, 
you will not be able to be a Christian on your own. You can live this good moral life or you can, you know, know that he's there and go do your own thing. But either way, that's not Christianity. That's not it at all. It needs to get to the point where you literally feel like what we're feeling right here, where, you know, you have that personal, tangible, you know, a, a relationship with him. Because if you can't have that personal relationship, you definitely, definitely will, will leave. Christianity is not easy. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like there's, there's things he's going to ask of you. It's like, just like anything else that's worth doing is not easy. Marriage is not easy, you know, and, right. but, but it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, you know what I mean? It's crazy. You say that cause, uh, David is a, Kano is a clear example. He got saved when he was like early twenties and in our fellowship and him and my brother were really good friends at the time, always around, you know, hanging around each other, serving God together Long story short, they backslide and he was gone for years. I mean, almost 10 years. Right. And this time around, he says, I finally understand and feel that relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Because even though he got saved at that time, maybe he didn't, he didn't have a full grasp of what a relationship was with God. You know, I'm not saying, not speaking for him, but from what he told me was now this time around, like he's got that revelation yeah. where he's completely surrendered and now God just changed him, you know, completely. He's not holding anything. Yeah, exactly. So it takes, sometimes it takes people longer, mm-hmm. especially, you know, like you yourself, you know, you grew up mm-hmm. raised and it took you, I'm pretty sure you said the sinner's prayer multiple times growing up. Oh, definitely. Right? Yeah, definitely. You thought you were saved. You're like, oh, I'm, this is the rest of my life, right? Mm-hmm. And it is possible to be saved and not have that personal relationship, but it's not going to last. Mm. You're always going to, because there's, when tough gets, whenever things get tough, because in Christianity, it will get tough at some point. Like it, let's not candy coat it. Like it is, it is tough in this modern world to not live this self-centered life. Yep. And what's going to keep you? Yeah, exactly. What's going to keep you? And the only thing that can sustain you is that personal relationship at that mm-hmm. point. That's it. You, you said something really interesting though. And you said the, the patient was so stimulated mm-hmm. and we were talking off camera earlier about creativity. And so uh, where a lot of artists have been known to use different drugs to enhance their creativity or to stimulate mm-hmm. themselves. And so uh, what, do you, what do you guys think about people using like hallucinogenics and different things? To well, be I know Jimi Hendrix was like known mm-hmm. for acid, yeah. right? Oh, and yeah. his bandana as he's shredding on the guitar. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I definitely think that, I mean, first of all, Satan is known for music, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Literally. It's literally like it was his job in heaven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that could very well play a, a role into that creativity in ushering like demonic music. Mm. O- opening doors or yeah. just yeah mm. spiritual in general like mm. you even think about I don't know if any of you guys have seen the movie I'm not Soul. saying rock is demonic because yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I love rock and roll but yeah. you know no <laughs> <laughs> you know like yeah. disclosure I have guitars all over my wall well yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyways I mean, continue I yeah no I yeah I was just saying like the movie Soul I don't know if you saw it yeah on Disney it. Plus yeah like even in that movie which is like a completely secular film yeah they describe like being crazy as like closest to the spiritual world, mm, like in a secular yeah, yeah. movie. Oh, yeah. when they're in the zone. Yeah, like they're in the zone, and like that's the peak point of spirituality. Oh yeah, you know. Well, and that's very interesting that you bring that up because in the end, like it's, it's so honestly, I have learned a whole lot about therapy and all these other things that I never thought I would need to know as a nurse, but. Um, one of the things that we do on my unit now is I play jazz or I play, you know, some calming music throughout the day because it stimulates that different part of the brain. It's the only thing like, you know, they've done, they've done like tests on this and, you know, have a patient listening to, you know, music versus the same patient not listening to the music. And it stimulates the brain in no other way, you know, that's Can you crazy. be stimulated? Well, it's in like the, in the, the Bible. Bible right? <laughs> yeah. King yeah. Solomon, they gave him a, there was a spirit that oh, took um, over Saul. Saul, yeah. yeah. Or Saul, I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, yeah. And they would, they would play the heart and the spirit would lead him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's for reals, man. Yeah. It's for reals. It does stimulate different parts of the brain that, you know, you only use, I, 
it's like it's a small percentage, less than seventy five percent of your brain yeah. most of the time. But you can actually get up in the thirties or you know forties sometimes. Um, whenever you're on these hallucinogens no. and <laughs> listening to music, like your brain starts to actually work harder and, and be more so useful. So what is your guys's, I mean, I, I understand the Bible says to be sober minded, but when you're on those hallucinogens and, and those things that tap into other areas of your brain, it's almost like it's obviously the unknown, but it's like, that's really going on. Right. Yeah. At all times but we're not supposed to have access to that. Mm. So what do you think about that? Like as a Christian is what, okay, why, why did God allow that part, that portion of your brain to be disconnected in our lives? Will that be open when we, Going to eternity, you know, I, and I wonder about that. Going back to the Garden of Eden, yeah, I was going to say back to the beginning. Yeah. There was the one tree, mm-hmm. right? That they couldn't, and so it was called what? The tree of knowledge, knowledge. of good and evil, right? So, what was the original sin? You can either know God, or you can know everything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and our fallen nature is we decide at some point we want to know everything else, and we mm-hmm. all we, all of us turn our back on God. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and that means that's still there. You know, that's, that's, that thing doesn't go away. Right. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? They, he, the servant said, your eyes will be open. Well, their eyes were open and they were naked for the first time. It that's wasn't a problem before that, was it? No, it wasn't. That's a good point. Then and then, a problem. So and they, then knew, says, they knew more, yeah, right? yeah, which was the downfall. And were they better right. off? And then you think about it, like right. they, they yeah. definitely had a good knowledge of God because it said that yeah, they Adam walked, walked in the cool of the day right. with God, mm-hmm. like, no one, no one here can say that, you know what I mean? Right. Like, and yeah. so, I mean, obviously we walk with God, but you know, it's through the Holy spirit now, but like, and it's also interesting because you look around and it, all we're seeing is God's perfect creation corrupted by man. Right. And then a bunch of spirits thrown into the mix who are cast down from heaven. You know, it's crazy because we try so hard to, I mean, mankind, when I say this to, um, know more, all the and time. It, and it ended up corrupting us to now we're the point where in order to know more, now you have to be on these hallucin- hallucinogenics, mm-hmm. acid and and shrooms in order to access other parts of your brain because now we don't, Yeah, we're not whole. Well, yeah. you think about hum- humanity always has to have the solution, mm-hmm. right? Like we have to come up with a solution. We can't, you know, pray for healing. We can't, you know what I'm saying? Like, so how do you, we are the solution. How do you combat the argument that, hey, God created those shrooms that that accessible you know um drug out there mm-hmm. that's natural how do you combat as a christian to the people that are going to say no th- those are natural marijuana is natural strychnine is natural is it not uh, yes yeah, it i was is. like the tree of knowledge of good and evil was natural <laughs> right like very organic and it's a, the same thing <laughs> again. so so yeah. when i say that then where does, where does, I mean, I, obviously to be sober minded is the commandment, right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. you could fall on because obviously those definitely mess with your, yeah. your mind and your state of being. Well, you even think about pot, right? Like don't drive high. Like that's a, a law, a yeah. secular law. So it's like, even though it's legalized, they, even they, though it's legalized, it's right. still, you do not, you're not allowed. So then that tells me too. I mean, obviously we don't live by you know, our law standards only, but that tells so, me people recognize it. So is there a form of creativity as a Christian and being sober minded versus what we just talked about? And let's step it up on which one's greater. Yeah. If, so mm-hmm. we talk, we see the way that the world or we or myself had tried to harness creativity or harness joy. You're, you're a musician. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so there was times I know when I'd, I'd get high and I'd play with people and you know and I remember one time I was in this garage band in high school and we we laid down this we didn't record it but we played this track and they're like hey you know just do something over this and I did it and uh and they're like oh that's great we're gonna you know do it again next week and man I was high as a kite and I I honestly don't remember (laughs) what I played (laughs) so we come back like two weeks later and they're playing it and they're like you don't remember do you (laughs) and it's just like you know it was like to them and in their mind, I was up here like, oh man, you, and then the next time. <laughs> so was it good? I guess. From what I remember. <laughs> Does it remember? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the thing is, uh, is trying to harness that creativity yeah. and, and, uh, 
it's really, a, it's, a, it's a very self-serving purpose. Yeah. If you think about even the secular artists that are out there and it's, listen, it's look at what I've created. Yeah. Mm. It's look at me. It's, mm, it's you're right. at the center is where perhaps conversely, when those gifts are used for God, it, uh, it's not to put any one person on display, but it's to benefit everyone else and give God the glory, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. Like I think about too is that going back to the beginning again, God is the ultimate creator. Like it's literally in like the first four words of the Bible. Like you know, it's the definition of God, like in who he is. And so I think about if Satan's always out to distort God or throw something in God's face, then what would be the great thing to do? God's creativity. He's saying, this is something you've crafted. This is something that you took all this time to the point of having God having to rest. Like, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? And he's the ultimate creator. So it shows how much in intricacy is in everything. You know, mm -hmm. like Miguel and I talk about this all the time. Like when we're giving a message or we're like creating a video or we're, you know, making a design or something like that, it's like, it's amplifying God, right? It's not taking it and isolating it. It's sharing it with people and amplifying a vision. Like it's not just our pastor's vision or it's not just these people. It's you know, cohesive. It, yeah, it's it's God's vision, mm -hmm. but we can use creativity to thereby, therefore amplify it. And if I could say something too, especially to you two guys, is uh, you know everything at our church, all the, the video, where are you guys? You're never in it. I mean, and to be honest with <laughs> yeah. you, to me, I, I'm just... Uh, like we did those, like we did a few videos and you did the recording oh, yeah, or the, J, and J, and JR did music the video. Yeah. And JR yeah. did the music. These are the unseen servants that yeah. are behind the scenes working tirelessly, you know, and our faces are on the video and you know, it's like, we're <laughs> not, they, who, you know, it, uh, we understand the glory is for God, yeah. but, uh, you, you know, know crazy, these guys crazy. humbling themselves to, to not be in the picture that no one knows who they are, what they're doing. And, you know, Pastor Warner's podcast, you're, you're helping to touch millions of people across the world. Those videos <laughs> that you spend all those hours making. And I, I just want to let you know how much I really appreciate you guys. Wow. Yeah. The hour, the hours and hours that no one sees behind the scenes to make that work. Wow. Uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Man. That's yeah. one of the things Thank I've you. always appreciated yeah. a yeah. lot. You guys don't get enough credit. You don't. It, you don't. Because yeah. I, I, me and you especially have been here to see the church evolve from mm -hmm literally zero technical know-how <laughs> and overhead projectors to slide <laughs> we're in the 21st century and we are you know yeah. you know that Pete is shredding everything. wirelessly on the camera <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's amazing it's amazing i remember being in a band uh i played drums uh, most most of my musical that's where i started then i i transitioned to guitar i was in a band called until glory um, for we, we actually started it with Andre, Debbie Ruth, Snow, um, myself, and I think Anthony Minor. And we created this song called um, You Love Me Always. Hmm. And there's a, a few other ones that they still do to this day that um, I remember when we were in practice, we were just, you know, the drum was playing a B, we were just going, uh. and the song just literally, like, just came out of nowhere. Wow. And every every position, bass, guitar, singers, melody, just fell into place instantly. Mm -hmm. And we were on like a little trend. Every practice we were writing a new like hit song that was just like anointed. You know, the creativity was just flowing. And you could just feel the presence of God every time we would practice. And we would come up with these songs and it was to a point where we're like, this song, this is one of the songs you hear on a radio, you know, and, and they still do the songs today and I'm not even involved in it anymore. And every time they play, I'm like, wow, mm, you could feel yeah. that anointing, you know, you could feel that presence, you could feel that creativity. So it's definitely, definitely possible. Yeah. And if, it, if anything, it's more effective, you know, when you're doing it with that purpose of yeah. worshiping God. Well, I think about, there was a situation like that happened to me, like at the beginning of this year, I was getting ready to travel for the conference film and I was going to like Mexico city. Then we were going to go to France and then to like Africa. And it was like super exciting. This, but all of this is under the fact that it's March 10th. So, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> right before <laughs> my son's birthday, right before COVID. Oh, man. Yeah. That's why you couldn't go. Cause yeah. Yeah. So it all is right there. So I'm in Mexico city. I'm doing these interviews, every interview I'm doing, like, I'm just like, whoa, this is insane. Like, this is powerful, like anointed. And usually, you know, we go to places and we film several interviews and we don't always get the chance to 
use every single one, you know, but here I was like, well, like I want to use, I was like thinking at that time, I was like, oh, I want to use all of these. <laughs> then March 15th comes, right? And I'm there. And then Pastor Warner calls me and he's like, church is, this is tonight is the final service and church is like online only. And I was like, never in a million years, you're like in another country, you're like, what is going on? And lo and behold, that I would have to come back, you know, barely make it back into the States. And then that was the only footage I could get. Like we did some footage in California, but like that was the only international footage I got. Wow. So literally like God and planned it. it's an it. international Bible conference. That's like the that's, key. That's it. <laughs> right. yeah. You need international footage. So I'm like, we went yeah. to Mexico and to Los Angeles. Like I was like, <laughs> <laughs> wow, I was like the two closest places to us, you know, in a way. And so it just blew my mind that every single one of those at the moment when I was like, wow, this interview is anointed. Every single one got used That's because awesome. of that. So it's just like, you've no idea the little things that God is doing in your And the focus your was probably even more on those interviews because yeah. you, you, didn't ha you didn't have to saturate it with other footage. Right. Like, this is what we have. Let's, and then I, I shout out to uh, Scribner. Yeah, uh, Nate is Nate amazing. Scribner because he was able to salvage and get other interviews out there for us. Yeah, to complete the that same video, time. you know, and I, that was crazy too. Is that during, during the conference films, like me, Miguel, Joe Gallegos, Nate Scribner, we're always working on this project, but sometimes we're never even together to see it happen. Yeah. Like, but this is actually the first year, like Miguel, me, Nate, and Joe were actually all in the same place, even in That's the awesome. midst of COVID. So it's just like, mm -hmm. I'm never going to put God in a box when it comes to a creative project ever again. Yeah. That's awesome. You know. Um, this episode is pretty interesting because uh, all of you guys, you know, you're, you have different stories, different lives, and you're all able to relate to the same thing, you know? And that's what's crazy about being a Christian, really. You know, there's a lot of people out there that don't have that fellowship and don't have yeah. um, the type of people that they can just, you know, hey, you want to be on my podcast? You know, <laughs> I, I really appreciate the church because it's, it's so hard. I could imagine being in a church that's not fellowship oriented and being like, hey, I got to get somebody on my podcast. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm able to just pull and say, hey, you want to be, you know, let's let's talk about your life. Let's talk about, you know, what you're involved in. Let's talk about what you've been through, you know, mm -hmm. and I just appreciate you guys for joining and being on this episode. Yeah, man. God is a personal God. And that's what makes it so amazing is like, I'm so far from perfect. It's not even funny, <laughs> but I think we can all sit here and admit that together. And that's what gives us that common ground. You yeah. know what I mean? That's yeah. amazing to me that, that he picks people like us, you know, to, to, to turn us around and show his glory through us. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and maybe constantly change to bring it full circle is that, you know, we will sometimes take drugs to be extraordinary. Mm. Is where we can, like you said, admit that we're very unordinary or, <laughs> or less less than anything spectacular. Mm -hmm. When we humble ourselves, yeah. so you're talking about you were in that band. The Holy Spirit comes and does what you can't do, right? right? Yeah, and, yeah, and, and takes and, and something I've, to the next level. Or like you, Michael, yeah, you yeah. know, taking these interviews overseas. Little did you know, but look, then you're able to put it on an international Bible conference. Mm. Yeah, you yeah. know, film, it's and it's 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 able to touch. And you know, when if God anything, gets the that glory. film touched more people because of COVID, because because everyone streamed, right? Because <laughs> there was no watching. One here. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you had more reach, even though you didn't put that much into it. It was yeah. you had to depend, right? You know, on God. Yeah. And and with the band, I've tried sitting there and writing <laughs> masterpieces. <laughs> I've tried, and it just doesn't come. Mm. It's yeah. just, I mean, you can come up, you can. There, there's there comes. There's only so much you can do with talent. Right. You know what I mean? And skill. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're you're doing so. I, I completely agree with what you're saying. And if you guys have anything that you want to know about and anything that you want to learn about these individuals and even others, just drop it in the comments, drop it down below. I hate, I hate sounding like a YouTuber, but that's just what it is. It is what it is. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, hit that like button, um, subscribe. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, watching the word exchange. A lot of people are, are tuning in, especially yeah. with, uh, follow us on TikTok. Yeah, TikTok, you know, uh, TikTok is, 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 it's weird. It's, it's strange it's so how weird. people are. It doesn't make any sense. But, you know, uh, the clips are going to be up on TikTok. So, you know, hit that follow button. Go to the YouTube channel. Thank you. We'll catch you guys later. All right. Peace, peace. out. Peace out.
That was awesome. Thanks, port exchange. Guys. Oh, that was yeah. Great. <laughs> you port exchange. <laughs> 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 so porty. <laughs>